Central Museum. My name is Elaine Didier, and it is my privilege to serve as director of the Library and Museum. We're delighted that you could be with us this afternoon for this special presentation. This afternoon's program is sponsored by the Hohenstein Center for Presidential Studies at Grand Valley State University. We are honored that the center selected the Ford Museum to be the site for this program. And I want to thank Leaves Whitney, the director of the Hauenstein Center, and of course, Ralph Hauenstein. <laughs> We're also very pleased that we have with us today Grand Valley President Tom Haas and his wife, Marcia, and also two v Grand Valley trustees, the chair, Kate Bu Pugh Walters, and also Noreen Myers. Please be recognized. <laughs> And finally, to bless this occasion, we have with us our Honorable Mayor, George Hartwell. <laughs> There's a story behind the way uh, Mrs. Carter decided to come to Grand Rapids, and that's because she has dear friends in Brent and Diane Slay. Uh, they are longtime friends and supporters of the Carters and the Carter Center, and we're very, very honored that they have this friendship and brought this program to us today. It is a rare treat for any presidential museum to have the opportunity to have a first lady or a first daughter, let alone as part of the same program, but that is our blessing today. It is a great pleasure for us to have the first daughter of President and Mrs. Ford with us today, and she's the only daughter as well, so that makes her doubly special. <laughs> Susan Ford Bales is a former photojournalist and the author of two books of fiction set at the White House. She is a highly articulate spokesperson on issues related to breast cancer, and with her mother, Betty Ford, helped establish October as National Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Susan has also been extremely active with the Betty Ford Center and its programs to address addiction, and served as chairman of the board for five years. She is also an honored trustee of the Ford Presidential Foundation, and in that role, is an avid supporter of all that we do at the library and the museum. Please join me in welcoming first daughter, Susan Ford Bales, who will introduce our distinguished speaker. As my brothers would say, yeah, Susan got everything because she's the only daughter in the baby, so. <laughs> and I did, so it's okay. I love it, love the position. Um, thank you, Elaine. Thank you, Marty. Good to see you. Thank you, uh, Grand Valley. It, it was a great lunch, and it was nice to see everybody always. Um, but it's always a thrill to be back in Grand Rapids, and I'm getting to stay a few more days this time instead of in and out, which is what my normal routine is. But this visit is particularly special because I bring warm greetings from Mother. She's at home in Rancho Mirage and doing very well, but we a wish she could be here and join us today. And I know very much she would have wanted to be here to see her dear friend and our special guest. As those of us in the Ford family have recounted many times in private and in public, Grand Rapids is all about friendships, deep friendships. And here in Grand Rapids, friendship is not just a word, it is used matter-of-factly. No, friendship here is quite simply a way of life, and friendship is a cornerstone of this community. So today is a shining example of why this, and why this is so a particular joy for me and for the Ford family to have this opportunity to welcome our special guest and friend back to Grand Rapids. I thought a great deal about how I would introduce this guest of ours and how I would adequately introduce her, someone who is so special to our family, to dad and to mom, but how I could adequately describe the depths of our friendship and love that have flourished between President and Mrs. Carter and dad and mother for decades. I admit several times along the way there weren't the right words or not enough words. People often ask me if it's really true that my parents have had such a genuine and deep friendship with the Carters for so many years. Perhaps understandably, in the current time of slash and burn politics and personal attacks, 
many people would find it impossible to believe that the man and the woman who in the 1976 presidential election handed mother and dad the only political defeat they ever suffered would be the same couple with whom my parents would have a devout friendship, the likes of which have not been seen since President and Mrs. Thomas Jefferson and President and Mrs. John Adams. Ladies and gentlemen, let me assure you from firsthand experience, the stories of that extraordinary friendship are indeed true. No more treasured friendship did dad and mother ever have than they have shared with President and Mrs. Carter. But let me per share a personal story, a story that illustrates the depths of our love and friendship. My parents shared with our guests and her husband. Many of you re will recall the wonderful state funeral services and ceremonies conducted for dad here in Grand Rapids. As our family came to learn, during the years before dad's death, there is an extraordinary amount of prior planning and detail required for a state funeral and my dad's was no exception. One of the most personal decisions in planning dad's funeral was deciding who, if anyone, besides our family and the official group, and with dad's casket would travel on Air Force One for his final journey home from Washington to Grand Rapids. And during a very private planning discussion with dad and mother, that question was posed to dad. His response was immediate, direct, and from the heart. And it would mean so much to me, Dad told Greg, that if you would make certain, certain that Rosalind and Jimmy are with Betty and the children for that final flight. And so it was. At the Grand Rapids Airport nearly four years ago, as the military body bearers gently moved Dad's casket from Air Force One there on the tarmac, having traveled from Washington with Mother and our family, just as Dad had wanted it were President and Mrs. Carter receiving Dad home to Grand Rapids for the final time. Mrs. Carter, your and President Carter's presence with us continue to bring us strength and comfort to mother and to our family each and every day. And to the degree words can simply not describe, most importantly, your continuing gift of love and friendship is one for which we will always be grateful and will always, always remember. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with a high honor and personal joy to present you a woman of strength, a woman of principles, a woman devoted to her husband and her family, a woman who is a tireless advocate for those less fortunate among us, and a woman who, a woman who all of us in the Ford family are proud to call our dear, dear friend, Mrs. Rosalind Carter. Wonderful, Susan. Thank you so much. Got all choked up. <laughs> well, I'm really glad to be here, and thank you for the introduction. Um, we did become really close friends with um, Gerald and Betty Ford, and being here has reminded me uh, so much of our time together and um, um, the good times we had. And um, Betty and I used to we worked on the same issues, um, um, women's issues. We worked on equal rights amendments together. Um, I wish we'd been more successful because it's never been ratified. Um, and um, she worked on substance abuse. I worked on mental health and the money comes from the same pot. And so uh, we would go to Washington together. She would get the Republicans together and I would get the Dem then I would get the Democrats together and we would um, lobby for our programs, and that, that was fun. Uh, and I found her to be so wonderful and so graceful. I just, she was just wonderful, and to do a press conference with her was so good. Um, we just fell in love with the family, and we unveiled once, and 
went by and had blueberry pancakes for breakfast with them and just got to know the family and the young people and uh, just really give Betty my love and I really care for her. Well, I have worked on mental health issues for a very long time. Uh, in January, it will be 40 years. I started when Jimmy was uh, inaugurated as governor, and that was 1971. And um, it's been an interesting journey, to say the least. Um, I, got, I became interested campaigning for Jimmy um, when he ran for governor. And the Community Mental Health Centers Act had been passed, and people were be being moved out of the institutions into the communities. The only problem was there were no services in the communities. And everywhere I went, people would ask me what uh, my husband would do for a mentally ill loved one who was in Central State, a big institution. Um, and, and I heard it over and over. And so one day I said, asked, said to ask Jimmy, what are you going to do for people with mental illness when you're governor of Georgia? And he said, we're going to have the best system in the country, and I'm going to put you in charge of it. <laughs> well, he didn't put me in charge of it because I didn't know anything about it at that time. But um, um, we had, uh, when he was elected then, four years later, we lost that first election. Uh, four years later, um, he established the Governor's Commission to improve services to mentally and emotionally handicapped. And I was a member of that committee. My job was to travel around the state and look at the um, mental health facilities and come back, and not to criticize them, but just come back and report to the committee on uh, commission members on what I saw. Services were um, almost non-existent. Then at that time, we knew nothing about the brain, and most people were just put away in the institutions, uh, sed kept sedated. Um, all of that has changed now. Um, everything's changed, but stigma is still with us. Then when I got to the White House, I had the President's Commission on Mental Health, and now I have a really good program at the Carter Center. We work on trying to overcome stigma and um, on trying to influence policy. We have an annual symposium, and we have the top leaders in the country uh, on whichever subject we are, take, um, are working on. We work on current issues. For instance, um, in November, our symposium is always in um, November, and this November our uh, subject is the mental health uh, problems of returning vets in the National Guard and the Reserves. We have had, a lot, we've done a lot of work on PTSD and um, working with those with traumatic brain injuries. Um, working with Columbia University, uh, my program at the Carter Center, I have fellowships for mental health journalism. And the Columbia University journalism program, I got interested in that, so I've been working with them for years. We bring journalists to the Carter Center to educate them about mental illnesses and try to and to teach them um, the language to the use because some things really hurt those with mental illnesses, um, and how to write end-up stories so that um, when a situation comes across, um, maybe that's sensational, so they know how to cover that without making it sensational and covering. Most of the time when something like that happens, almost always, the person who is involved has been failed by the mental health system. And so we try to, um, have uh, journalists write good in-depth stories so people will understand what happened and why it happened. We've had uh, over a hundred journalists go through the program now, and I do think it's been the most successful one we've ever done um, against stigma. Um, I, um, and, and to get, go back a little bit to um, National Guard and um, Reserves, people in these uh, um, organizations don't, uh, in, uh, in these, this military, don't have the same, don't come home to the same supports that their the regular military have. Um, regular military don't have enough. But what has happened now is that the public is concerned about people coming home. And so that's put a lot of emphasis on PTSD 
and other um, and depression and, and, and um, challenges that the veterans have when they come home. Um, and, and now there's being a lot of research that's being started and being done, something we should have done a long time ago, but we should have done research on most every, more on most every illness, but um, there's not been enough done on PTSD particularly. And so the people who come um, home from the Guard and the Reserves come back to their communities, to their jobs and their families. And um, so many of them don't have any support. I have a young man at home who came home and he's, he's in prison now because he has, suffers from PTSD. We tried to get him help and he stayed in a facility for about three weeks and left. Well, we can't make him go back and of course he got in trouble and now he's in prison. So they don't have the supports that the others have. And, um, and also, they're not, I don't think any of our troops are familiar with the type of fighting they're doing there where every day they go out and, and never know whether they're coming back. Um, but the army has been trained, to, uh, the regular army, to a, a small degree, I suppose, um, better than the National Guard and, and Reserve. So, we have the best people in the country coming. We have uh, Catherine Powers, who is a director of the um, Substance Abuse um, Center, uh, division of the HHS. I have some really good friends in Washington now. Uh, Kathleen Sebelius, who um, is head of, head of HHS, was governor. Her father was governor when Jimmy was governor. And the head of the Labor Department was an intern in Jimmy's office when he was president. So I, I have a, some really good contacts <laughs> in Washington now. Um, well, I have written, this is my second book. The first one written in late 1990s was so out of date, I was going to update it. And when I started looking through, with it, through it, there's no way it could be updated. I had to, because of all the changes, I had to start over. And the themes of the book, I'm gonna be brief because I think I had 10 minutes. The themes of the book are recovery, now, and, and these are the things I want people to know just in a thumbnail sketch. Now, um, mental illnesses can be diagnosed, they can be treated effectively, and people can recover. It's just incredible uh, from knowledge of the brain, but also of consumer movement. Consumers are people living with mental illnesses. And they started a, um, uh, we, I, we call it a revolution. They, decide, they demanded that they be involved in their treatment. And it's been so wonderful to what's happening. They go out, and in Georgia we have uh, over 500 certified peer specialists. And Medicaid pays them. And this one friend of mine who helped get that started said, Medicaid doesn't pay people um, when they're incompetent. And so what it does for their self-esteem, it just kind of, it works so well when those people who have mental illnesses and, rec and have recovered understand exactly what the others are going through, and it's just been remarkable what's happened. Um, prevalence is the second thing. Mental illnesses affect everybody. They touch every family. One in every four people in the United States will be diagnosed with a mental illness uh, this year, every year, one, uh, one in four. Um, and. and um, Mental illnesses do not discriminate. They touch anybody and everybody. And uh, then stigma. Stigma is the greatest barrier to getting treat people into treatment. Um, and, and I have new information um, done from some studies we had at the Carter Center and Columbia University and one other university. I've got just gotten this report, but it says that People now are beginning to understand, in a, a large majority of people, that uh, mental illnesses um, are brain disorders and that they should be treated by mental health professionals and that has had nothing to do with overcoming stigma. This is so sad to me because I, how many years have I worked on stigma? That's what I started with in 1971. And, um, and now we find out we're doing it the wrong way. And what this paper says is that we need to f focus on the person because even though people know that they are brain disorders, it bo that bothers them. You know, they're fearful of brain disorders. We need to start focusing on the individual 
Uh, how we're going to do that, I don't know, but we, maybe we can work it out some way. I really do think it makes a difference, though, because if a person is in the community and has a mental illness but is um, raising a family or, ho or going to work every day and people realize that these people have had mental illness and recovered, if we could get them into the, to organizations in the community like women's groups, um, Kiwanis and Rotary and those kinds of clubs, and get people to see that they have had the illness, they are recovered, and living good, fulfilling lives in the community. That, I think that might be really helpful to overcome the stigma. And the other thing is prevention. Early intervention and prevention have the potential to reduce the risk and severity of mental illness, especially among children. Another thing we've learned is that mental illnesses are developmental illnesses. We never thought that. The mental health community for years thought that children hadn't been in the world long enough to have mental health problems. But, but now we know, and so there's a lot of research going on to try to identify the children that um, are, are, are at risk for mental illnesses. And if there's any, and I, I'm trying to tell mothers everywhere, if you have babies, please watch them carefully. See how they react to the parents. Um, see how they react to um, siblings, to uh, uh, whether they meet the normal milestones of, of walking or crawling and, and so forth. Because, and if it's any, any deviation, take them to a doctor. Because now we know that mental illnesses can almost always be mitigated so they don't get worse. And sometimes um, um, people won't develop an a, 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 a episode. And so those are the things that I do it right about in the book. I use a lot of stories. It's not a long book. And um, I hope it will overcome some of the myths and misconceptions about mental illnesses. Um, that's my dream of someday overcoming stigma um, because it not only humiliates and embarrasses people, but it keeps them from getting treatment because they don't want to be labeled mentally ill. Well, thank you for having me here today. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Carter, for those very wise comments and really, I think, a call to action. And thank you for writing such a beautiful and compelling book for Americans to consider. Well, I'm Gleaves Whitney, director of the Hallenstein Center for Presidential Studies at Grand Valley. And I'm very proud to be in this partnership with the Ford Presidential Foundation, Ford Library and Museum to bring you programs such as this and to help host Mrs. Carter. It's really been an honor. Well, it's my happy task to usher us into the next part of the program, and uh, we're going to have a panel of three experts. I'd like for you, please, to come on up to the table while I introduce the three of you. Greg Jodish, Mark Eastberg, and Paul Ippel. Greg Jodish received his Ph.D. in psychology from the University of Wisconsin-Madison with an emphasis on experimental psychology and neurophysiology. He is the president and the CEO of Touchstone Innovare, a private nonprofit agency that provides outpatient services to people who suffer from mental illness and also substance abuse. He also serves on the board of the Mental Health Association in Michigan and has been its chair and treasurer. He is a member of the board of the Mental Health Foundation of West Michigan. He's published in peer-reviewed journals and is presented nationally on the application of the chronic care model in integrating behavioral health care back into the health care system. Mark Eastberg, in the middle, is president and CEO of Pine Rest Christian Mental Health Services, a position he has held since 2006. He is also the executive director of Healthy Marriages Grand Rapids. A clinical psychologist, Dr. Eastberg has held a number of clinical and administrative leadership positions since joining Pine Rest in 1991. He received his doctoral training at the Fuller Graduate School in Psychology 
in Pasadena, California, and he maintains an outpatient practice in individual and couples therapy. Dr. Eastberg serves on the board of directors and is board secretary for Covenant Retirement Communities, the fourth largest nonprofit retirement system in the U.S. Paul Ipple has served as the Network 180 Executive Director for eight years. Network 180 is the Mental Health Authority and Substance Abuse Coordinating Agency for Kent County. Mr. Ipple served in senior administrative positions for Hope Network for 13 years. He also served as Executive Director of the Christian Health Association of Liberia in West Africa for six years. Mr. Ipple has a Master's in Social Work from the University of Michigan and a BA from Calvin College. He serves on the executive board of the Michigan Association of Community Mental Health Boards, as well as on the board of the Kent County Family and Children's Coordinating Council and the board of the Mental Health Foundation of West Michigan. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome these three experts. Now, each of these gentlemen will have uh, five to eight minutes to make his case and respond to Mrs. Carter, and we'll start with Paul. Thank you, uh, and thank you, Mrs. Carter, for um, sharing those words. Um, the stigma still exists in Kent County. Does suicide occur in West Michigan? What impact has mental illness had on our community? Mrs. Carter describes in her book an incident that occurred in Grand Rapids when a gentleman named Willie Thurman was arrested for stealing a vehicle. It was Willie's birthday. He saw an unmanned, or unmanned car with its engines running. In his delusional state, he interpreted the car as a birthday gift from his family. Willie was arrested, taken to the Kent County Correctional Facility, and during the booking process, officers took his glasses, sprayed him with pepper spray, and uh, Willie fell down unconscious. He was taken to the hospital where he was pronounced dead from a lack of oxygen. Happily, much has changed in our community since that date. We have a mental health wing in our jail, and mental health screenings are conducted for each jail admission. We have a jail diversion program that seeks to provide mental health services to individuals as an alternative to incarceration, but stigma still exists. Stigma can be identified as a mark or label imposed by others that leads to devaluation and discrimination. The stereotypes of stigma lead to prejudice and discrimination. Stigma can reinforce, reinforce stereotypic beliefs about individual weakness or lack of motivation or a propensity toward violence. Stigma in our community has led us to fail to recognize mental illness as a disease that impacts the individual and their family in the same way that a cancer or a diabetes impacts that individual and family. So what actions are we taking in this community to combat stigma? I hope that you know something about the Mental Health Foundation. This organization has spent the past 20 years combating stigma. Last week, this organization had a an event, a celebration at the GUI Center. Uh, the event was called Shining Through. This annual event recognizes and celebrates the artistic talents of persons with a mental illness with an art auction where each artist is recognized for their talents and abilities. The foundation also, also offers classes to middle school and high school students in our community under a program called Live, Laugh, and Love. These classes introduce our young people to the signs of mental illness and help them understand the impact of isolation in the classroom or bullying. The classes encourage students to support and care about each other, especially the emotional needs of each other's students, with a message that help is always available. This group also sponsors an annual Stomp Out the Stigma Walk in downtown Grand Rapids to raise awareness about the mental illness and to emphasize the fact that treatment works and recovery is happening. Another partner organization in our community is the Suicide Coalition. This group is made up of interested community members, including family members who have used their own personal experience dealing with suicide to educate our community about the signs of suicide and the need for action. They have engaged in this community education by sponsoring plays and promoting community discussion on this important topic. And there's other groups that exist in our community. The Prevention Coalition, 
is made up of community partners that want to educate our young people and adults about the negative impact of the misuse of drugs and alcohol. This group is actively working to discourage underage drinking, the use of marijuana, and binge drinking among adults. And they have challenged us as an entire community to think about how our behavior, the way we use drugs and alcohol, impact their, the behaviors of our children and other vulnerable adults. There's an organization that's recently been created, created in our community called the Recovery Academy. It's an organization that is operated by persons with a mental illness who assist each other in learning to better understand and manage their illness. They hold classes and learn from each other about recovery. And they're also helping our mental health system to design and evaluate the mental health services offered in our community. Mrs. Carter mentioned the peer support specialists, and I'm happy to say we also have peer support specialists in Kent County. These individuals use their personal experience with a mental illness to help others recognize that treatment can work and that recovery from a mental illness is possible. They provide realistic information about how to use the mental health system to manage illness in a way that can lead to a meaningful, productive life. Our most recent effort in this community at combating stigma involves the development of a children's system of care using a SAMHSA-funded Community Family Partnership Grant. This effort will encourage all service agencies that support children and families in our community to work together to develop an integrated service plan for children and families. Parents and children who receive those services will be involved in the development of those services and also help other parents in carrying out those services. This involvement will make it easier for others to succeed. So what can you do about stigma? The first thing is that we all need to share our personal experiences. Each of us have been touched by a person who's been exposed or experienced mental illness a child, a spouse, a co-worker, a neighbor, a member of our faith community, or a group that we're involved in. We need to talk about these experiences, including the progress and the failures. Remember when we as a community would only whisper the word, the C word, instead of talking about cancer. We contribute to the stigma of mental illness when we fail to recognize and talk about mental illness as we would talk about any other illness that our family or friends have. The second thing we need to do is tell others that recovery is happening. Stigma encourages a person or family to deny that mental illness exists. This denial leads to not seeking services or covering up when services are being provided. Mental health treatment works. We need to talk about our successes and our failures. As with any illness, the individual and family need to be supported during the treatment process. They need to be encouraged. And as with other medical treatments, including cancer, some treatments are more successful with one individual than another. We need to provide encouragement, support, and hope to persons and families seeking recovery. A third thing we can do is to join our local community efforts to combat stigma. We need your help. Join the Mental Health Foundation. They have a club called Live, Laugh, and Love. They have fun social events that help raise money to fund the educational programs that I previously described. Look for opportunities to speak out in your work or social settings where stigma is not recognized. Make a promise to participate in at least one event each year that works to combat stigma. Each year we have an event called Recovery Palooza that helps celebrate the recovery efforts of individuals who've been challenged by a substance use disorder. Golfers can join the Mental Health Foundation's annual Drive Out the Stigma Golf outing or join the annual Suicide or Stomp Out the Stigma Walk. What we need to do is create a community where all illness is recognized and treated, where stigma is actively combated and recovery is celebrated. We've had got a great community in West Michigan. Where else can you have a 500-foot water slide on a city street? Or are thousands of paper airplanes floating in downtown Grand Rapids? We have Art Prize and the Medical Mile. Wouldn't it be wonderful if our community was recognized as the premier place in the country for a recovery from a mental illness or a substance use or disorder? A community that supported individuals and families that were dealing with mental illness. A community that demonstrated support and compassion. Perhaps some of you have heard about a town in Belgium called Giel. During the Middle Ages, many persons sought treatment for their mental illness, or what was known as a mental illness, then by visiting a church in that town. Because so many visitors came to the town, the church leaders said to the community, the townspeople, they needed to open all of their homes to the visitors and give them a place to stay. Giel's unique history and experience has created a community virtually devoid of negative stigma relative to mental illness. The Giel community today continues to be a model of community recovery. 
What does that model look like? A total community integration, absence of negative myth-based stigma, flexibility and care. So what do we want Grand Rapids and West Michigan to become? We want to be a place where we acknowledge the human needs of those with mental illness and their families. We want to respond to those needs by providing social opportunities and meaningful work in our community. We want to accept those with mental illness as full members of our community. We want to show flexibility in the programs and approaches in order to address the individual needs of each person. We no longer can tolerate stigma in this community. With your help, we can create this kind of community. Thank you. This one's even working. Thank you, Paul, and, and thank you, Mrs. Carter, for your 40 years of advocacy. We know we have a long way to go, but you've brought us a long way already. Thank you. Um, on the corner of Cherry and Sheldon, there's a building going up. It's called the Heart of the City Health Center. We're building that along with Cherry Street Health Services and ProAction Behavioral Health Alliance. And in that building is going to be a team of people moving in next year who will be treating people who have multiple chronic illnesses will be helping them manage their illnesses so that they don't interfere in how they want to lead their life. It will just so happen that some of those illnesses for some of the people will be mental illnesses. But they won't be there because they have a mental illness. They'll be there because they have a chronic illness. What I want to do now is to give a five minute story of the 10 year journey that we've taken to get to this point. And I want to ask the question, is it time to reunite with healthcare? Um, those of you in the business know that what we do is called behavioral health. Well, what's the rest of healthcare? We call it physical health, okay? Sometimes people will talk about heart health, but when you talk about heart health, you never say, well, then there's physical health. And it's almost as though what we think and what we do and how we feel has nothing to do with the hormones flowing through our blood or the synapses firing in our brain. How did we let this happen? Well, short history. We did it to ourselves. In the late 1970s and the early 1980s, um, we created behavioral health carve-outs. In Grand Rapids, that happened in 1982. I know that because I was there and I was part of making it happen. It seemed like a great idea at the time. What was happening then is that managed care companies were offering providers of substance use disorder and mental health services the opportunity to take their two or three cents out of every premium dollar and protect it from the rest of healthcare. And we leaped at the chance to do that because we didn't want healthcare to somehow overwhelm our small little bit of healthcare. And so we created behavioral health carve-outs. In fact, that's about the time that we coined the term behavioral health because we wanted it to be separate from the rest of healthcare. Now, what's happened since then is that we have huge multi-billion dollar behavioral healthcare management companies in this country whose very existence depends on keeping the kinds of services that we provide separate from the rest of healthcare. And then there are people who have a serious mental illness. This story starts a lot longer than that. More than two centuries ago, we took it on ourselves to provide people with a serious mental illness asylum. It really was that. It was a very good thing to do because it protected them and the rest of us from each other. Those asylums turned into state hospitals and eventually became essentially a state mandate in the state of Michigan protected by the Constitution to provide services to people who have serious mental illnesses. As we moved people out of the institutions, though, we essentially brought the institutions with us. We brought separation. We brought the stigma. We brought our attitudes. We brought the carve-out of the carve-out out into the community. Even now, in the state of Michigan, most commercial insurance policies, if they have a behavioral health benefit, will exclude coverage for people who have a serious mental illness because that's the responsibility of the state because that was the responsibility of the state hospitals, because that was the responsibility of insane asylums. And so now we have billion dollar governmental organizations, not only in Michigan, but throughout the entire country, whose very existence depends upon maintaining the carve out of the carve out 
for people who have serious mental illnesses. And then there's substance use disorders. Substance use disorders, as we all know, are really just sort of a sign of moral deficiency or weakness. And that's how treatment developed. It was never a part of medicine. There weren't any procedures. There weren't any pills. Substance use disorder treatment has always almost been an afterthought, even within the carve-out of the carve-out of serious mental illness from the rest of behavioral health care. Now, we all know when things get themselves organized and they get themselves big and they involve an awful lot of money, they tend to keep themselves going without a great deal of introspection about what it is they're doing or why it's doing it that way. But what we have is we have a fragmented healthcare system from which people who have a mental illness or a serious mental illness or a substance use disorder are provided care that has its own funding and its own language and its own regulations all the way from federal law right on down to local regulations and their own sense of purpose. And this isn't necessarily a good thing any longer. Now some things are starting to change. One of the things that is prompting change is that a few years ago, uh, there was a study that was published that found out that people who were served in programs like ours at Touchstone and Ovare were dying on the average 25 years younger than the average person. Schizophrenia wasn't killing them. Bipolar disorder wasn't killing them. A lot of other health conditions were killing people early. And this was started to raise some concerns. You know, it wasn't fun being on the side of a program that was killing people 25 years early by keeping them separate. The reaction of the behavioral health care community, I'll just editorialize here, is I don't think necessarily a very good one because in a lot of places, programs like mine are creating primary care within their organizations. Now, you might say that's great because at least people with a serious mental illness then are getting good primary care. But where are they getting it? They're getting it in the carve-out of the carve-out. They're not getting it with the rest of healthcare. And so I think that we need to be provoked by that statistic. We need to be appalled by it, and we need to do something about it. But we don't necessarily need to do it outside of the realm of all of healthcare by keeping basically our institutional thinking going. There are some other things that are happening, and these innovations aren't coming from behavioral healthcare organizations. They're coming from the rest of healthcare. The biggest one is the discovery that chronic illnesses can be effectively managed. Those of us who are old enough to remember that diabetes was virtually a death sentence, okay? If you got it, you were going to lose your eyesight, you were going to lose your feet, and it was going to be very unpleasant. That has changed dramatically over the years. And so what we're starting to discover in the rest of medicine is that there are effective ways of managing chronic illnesses. One of those is called the Wagner Chronic Care Model, which was developed more than 10 years ago and is just starting to catch on. Things tend to move a little bit slowly in healthcare. What we're also starting to discover is that if you've got more than one chronic illness, you know, if you happen to have diabetes and hypertension, it sometimes helps to treat those things together because they interact within your body. We're discovering that depression frequently co-occurs with chronic illnesses like heart disease and diabetes. And good chronic care management programs are reinventing things that behavioral health care programs had started many years ago. They're reinventing cognitive therapy for the effective treatment of depression and anxiety. And they're developing things called health coaches because what they're discovering is 40 or 50 percent of the people with chronic illnesses don't take care of themselves the way they should. We don't call that resistance anymore or noncompliance. We call that pre-contemplation. It's a stage of change, something that medicine has borrowed from, of all places, substance use disorder treatment. They use a thing called motivational interviewing now in health coaching for chronic health conditions. But medicine is only going so far in their treatment of co-occurring chronic health conditions. They'll treat depression, they'll treat anxiety. One of these days they'll discover substance use and they'll start treating that as a co-occurring condition. But they haven't quite discovered schizophrenia or bipolar or major depression yet. There are some other things that are happening, and this is a really important one. Um, with the health care reform that's coming out, regardless of what you might think of it politically, one of the things that will be happening is that there will be 
two changes. One is that parity for mental health conditions will be brought to virtually all health insurance policies through the health exchanges. And the other, and this is actually even more important than that, people will be able to get Medicaid without having to become disabled. I'll just mention this. Potentially disabling conditions like asthma and diabetes and congestive heart failure um, don't necessarily always have to result in a disability if they're effectively managed and if they're caught early. Schizophrenia does not cause an immediate and inevitable disability, nor does bipolar, nor does major depression, and yet we tend to act that way when we get the diagnosis. We force many people who have those illnesses to become disabled in order to get coverage to treat their illness. If you don't have a disability and you're between the ages of 21 and 65 and you're poor, you can't get Medicaid. You have to become disabled. If you have schizophrenia and you want to pay for your medications, you have to prove that you are disabled. That's not a good thing if you're not already disabled. So I think that's one thing that we need to consider is that healthcare reform offers the opportunity to break through that barrier of inevitable disability in order to get treatment. Where do all these things come together? Well, it comes together around the treatment of chronic illnesses, not physical illnesses, not non-physical illnesses, but chronic illnesses. If you have a chronic illness, what you should be able to do is go to a place that provides effective treatment so that you can manage that illness so it has the least possible effect on how you want to lead your life. If you've got more than one chronic illness, you want to go to a place that helps you manage both of them, or three of them, or four of them. Those of us who fight stigma will sometimes say things like, well, schizophrenia is, you know, it's like diabetes. But do we really mean that? Do we really mean it's like a chronic illness? Or do we mean it is a chronic illness? If we really believe that schizophrenia is a chronic illness, then if someone's got schizophrenia and diabetes and hypertension, and a lot of people do, then what they should be able to do is go to a place where all of those chronic illnesses can be treated together and one of them just happens to be a mental illness. And we can say mental illness like the way we say a heart disease. We can say mental health like we say heart health and not have to contrast it with physical health. And so I just wanted to make the case that it is time for our business to become reunited with the rest of healthcare. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you to, to, to Paul, first of all, for painting, I think, a very exciting vision of what could be in our, in our community in Grand Rapids in terms of a stigma-free community. That was um, engaging and, and exciting to think about what could we do together to completely rid Grand Rapids of stigma. And, and thanks to Greg for the, the, really the case for the integration of, of all medical care just as we're integrated people, just as we're mind, body, and spirit, to bring those together in terms of the healthcare system. I think that was a great history. And thank you, Mrs. Carter, for your comments and remarks about um, mental health and mental illness and your, for your advocacy over the 40 years, which I think we're, we're seeing the benefits of that work here in Grand Rapids in terms of what, what Paul talked about earlier, uh, what Greg's talked about. My, 14-year-old came home from school two weeks ago and said, hey, Dad, we're learning about stigma. And I think I uh, had that uh, as part of the Live, Laugh, and Love project. And would that have happened 20 years ago? I don't think so. And he was curious about it and asked questions about it. 
And th it's that kind of openness that I think is creating a healthy culture in our community. But I'd like to pick up on, on a remark Mrs. Carter made about stigma, and in particular about the study that, uh, that she cited, I believe came from Columbia. Just to back up a little bit, Paul defines stigma for us and all many of its effects in terms of housing, employment discrimination, uh, self-discrimination, in terms of the self-stigmatization that goes on. Um, there's been this sense of that, that uh, part of mental illness, there's a moral deficiency or moral weakness. And, and I think for many years that has created a distance between individuals in the society that would otherwise be together. And it seemed to be common sense that if you talked about mental illness as a brain disease, that that, that would just evaporate. Just as there was a stigma of it, about cancer, people started talking about cancer, and, and, and eventually now it's common to talk about um, one's diagnosis. The thought is that once we understood the brain better, that these are there's some genetic components to some of the, the diseases that there are. Um, there's neurons at work here. There's um, imbalances that need to be corrected. You think that that would create some destigmatization, would create, gain more acceptance. And what the study has found that uh, Mrs. Carr alluded to is that while it seems to, that attitude change seems to have increased the acceptance that um, treatment is important and necessary versus some sort of moral correction that treatment is important and necessary, it hasn't had an impact on stigma. And this is perplexing, um, somewhat discouraging because a lot of work in the past 20 years was based on the premise that more information about the disease would perhaps yield this, um, this dramatic change of, of attitude, but it doesn't seem to have done that. Um, in fact, it may be that some of that has, some of that, the researchers are showing that some of that awareness that there's a, a neurological component to the, these disorders may contribute to stigma in, in a sense of hopelessness. Well, it's a brain disorder, there's nothing can, that can be done. It's, uh, there's a genetic disorder and so there, there is an effective treatment. And so we seem, while that's important information to get out there, we seem to have reached perhaps the limits of the benefits of that information in terms of the public's attitude. And, um, you know, Mrs. Carter rightfully said, so what do we do now? What's our, what's our new model for addressing stigma? And, and a, a couple of comments you made, and, and also were echoed by Paul, I think holds the key in terms of a new model, and that's, the openness that we need, need to have about our own walk and our own journey with mental illness. That it affects my family. It affects the, my friends and neighbors. That we're all impacted by, um, by depression at some time. Many of us are impacted by depression at some time in our lives. Anxiety is commonplace. But we all have this, our dark periods in our life. And many of us have sought treatment for it. And that treatment has helped. It's powerful when community leaders can stand up and say, I've struggled with depression, or I've struggled with an addiction, and, and I've overcome it, or I'm, man it's, I'm managing it now, and my life is deeper and fuller. So I think, I think that's the, the beginning of the new paradigm, or new model of combating stigma, is to, for us to be open, talking about it, sharing with our neighbors, sharing with, with community groups that it is among us, it's our story, and that treatment and help is there. When I first got into the, the field um, 20 years ago, I was a new student, and some of the, the psychotropic medications that people took, took just weeks and weeks to work. Um, they had very difficult side effects. Compared to now, where the, the treatment, you begin to see the reduction of symptoms, lifted mood within, within a week 
or less. We need to be talking about those stories. We need to be hearing about those advancements because they're there. There's a lot of good news out there. So thank you, Mrs. Carter, for sharing some of that good news with us and for uh, pointing us the way forward as we think about reducing stigma. Thanks to all three panelists for a very cogent response, very interesting. I think we're all getting quite a tutorial right now on the state of mental health and especially the stigma that everybody has mentioned. Well, this is the time now for you to participate. Now, a couple of us up here are uh, classroom <coughs> teachers, so if you're shy, we're gonna start calling on you for <laughs> questions. This is the time for you, though, to submit a question for the panelists to respond to. I have two right now, and I see that there, do we have somebody who can pick these questions up. We have some in the middle, so if we have Mandy and a couple of others, could you please pick these up? And in the meantime, I have a question for you. Politicians tell us that they want statistics for recovery rates to determine an appropriate level of funding uh, when it comes to mental health. And so what do you think about the reliability of statistics in this area? And trying to gather those statistics. Any of you? Is this on? Okay. Um, one of the things that mental health services has suffered from for decades is the inability to effectively measure its results. And so I would have to say that if our payment was depending on being able to demonstrate results, uh, my opinion is that that would not be a very good thing, that the statistics that we have aren't very reliable and, and aren't very direct. Uh, I believe that we're very close to being able to come up with those. It will take some will to do that. I would echo that. One of the new mantras in healthcare is reimbursement for results. And I think that's in the uh, traditional medical world becoming increasingly important. Um, I think that we have been a little far behind in behavioral health, but it's coming and we need to prepare for that. We need to demonstrate the value that's there. I think this chair was supposed to be for me because my <laughs> program, my schedule said I was to come up, but I wanted to answer that question because it's the same thing we hear all over and over again. I had to, we had the mental health community, worked and worked and worked to get statistics of employers who covered their uh, employees with mental health coverage, who had mental health coverage for them. And it didn't matter. We had some major uh, companies that were uh, covering their employees. And, and they found over a period of time that um, when, they, when the employers did, the health costs actually came down. Because when somebody has depression or anxiety, they go to the doctor, primary care doctor. They go to the doctor. They keep going to the doctor and they don't get any help. But it took a while in almost every one of these companies for somebody to access the mental health services because of the stigma. But once one did, then another one would straggle in and pretty soon it just came to be the thing to do. And so they didn't go to the primary care doctor nearly as much. And so overall costs came down. And um, we started, I mean, I don't, I don't remember how many years ago, but it took us forever to get enough st statistics for them. And we had to get almost every, well, it's not true to say we got every employee in the United States, but we got a lot of them. We had to keep <laughs> on and keep on and keep on. Nothing was enough for them. They just don't want to cover mental illnesses, and that's the stigma. It, it uh, curtails programs for mental health issues, and it's frustrating. It's very frustrating to me. You can get all the money you want for jails and prisons. Jails and prisons are the largest mental institutions in the country. You can't, mm. and, and you can't get money for mental health programs. I get very frustrated about it. <laughs> We're, uh, actually, Kent County is engaged in a really interesting uh, attempt in this area. And it's actually been initiated by our county commission. I don't know how many of you know this, but Kent County has, the county government has decided to spend 
about $2 million a year on um, prevention initiatives for our children. And it's, it, there's a significant research component engaged in it, but it's looking at children's mental health, it's looking at children's attendance in schools, it's looking at, children, it's looking at our, uh, our, our removal rates for taking children out of homes uh, because of uh, abuse and neglect, it's looking at um, all uh, what happens in the juvenile court and, and kids' um, success in school as well as their enrollment in probation. Um, and it's going to be a longitudinal study. We are hoping that this will go on for 10 years, but they're actually having a way to look at um, how do these various services impact a child's life and what difference does it make for them um, when these services are provided over a 10-year period. Thank you. Okay, next question. Do you anticipate that the cost of drugs to treat the mentally ill will come down to reasonable prices in the near future? And why are they so high? I let somebody who works on the finances talk to me. <laughs> can, can I, may I correct you on something? Um, people who have met, live with mental illnesses don't like to be called the mentally ill. You say people first, it is a person with mental illness. And that's one thing we teach our um, fellows, journalism fellows at the Carter Center. So I thought I would teach you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the teacher up here got the lesson. Actually, we're, we are already seeing this impact. I, um, there, there have been a significant number of uh, drugs that have gone down in price. I think even the $4 Walmart Meyer kind of programs that are going on actually have opened up some options. But the other part of this, of course, is all the tremendous new drugs that are being developed and the costs associated with them. So we kind of have the two extremes going on where some of the older drugs are actually going down in price, but the new drugs are uh, astronomical, really. And so I think it remains an issue. Anybody else want to respond to that? Okay. Next question. This gets back to the veterans issue that Mrs. Carter raised. In 2009 alone, over 18,000 U.S. service members checked into military hospitals with mental, for mental issues compared to 11,000 for physical wounds. When will our service members who come home from Afghanistan and Iraq get the care that they need? How do you recommend we help the next greatest generation? I don't have the answer to that, but I do know that um, um, the stigma is so bad that many, many veterans are not going for help, and that's a tragedy. And, um, but I know also that I said in my remarks that there is so much research going on now because the public got excited about it, I mean got concerned about the veterans coming home. So I hope we can get some answers to that. But. Um, um, and the ones who come home to the regular army come, to, come home to bases, most of them, where there's some support. <clears throat> and the families on the bases are taken care of. And, and so that's good. But when they come to the communities, they have to depend on the public and the community. And so I think one thing we're going to have to start doing now <clears throat> is um, providing services in the community. There are several really good examples in the country. In Colorado, for instance, and also um, Secretary Sebelius told me in um, Oklahoma, where is she from now? <laughs> Ohio, Ohio? Anyway, um, that she started um, with the head of the National Guard. When, it, when every, every uh, veteran that comes back to that state gets, um, has somebody meet them, and, and tell them about all of the services that are available to them and help them uh, to find them. And also, um, in Colorado, Jeannie Ritter um, has, a, if there is a, a veteran in the community when another veteran comes home, that veteran meets them if they are, if they are doing well. Um, because some of them have problems of their own. But they get a veteran to meet them. They got the whole community together. Um, with the, the different service clubs, 
volunteers, mental health uh, um, uh, associations, and they just fold that veteran in to be sure he or she gets the right treatment. And I think we're going to have to start doing that in our communities all across the country. I'd just like to say that although stigma continues to be an awful thing, think about the progress that we've made that 18,000 people can identify themselves as having a mental health problem and think about what it was like in 1945 or 1952 or 1974 and how long, how far we've come since the last time that has happened to our country. We have a long way to go. We have a long way to go. Next question. Uh, unfortunately, this is going to have to be the last question just because we're running over time right now. We promised Mrs. Carter and the others that they could uh, get back to their, uh, their work. But this is a, a good segue, uh, Mark and Mrs. Carter, that you just provided. Uh, how do you overcome self-stigma? It interferes with getting the services. How do we combat this so that people have the courage and the awareness to seek mental health? I think I would just echo what uh, has been said already. It, there's a certain role modeling that can be very powerful as a person tells their story. So if I tell you my story about things that I've struggled with over time, and you can relate to that as another person, um, you see that um, we're all in this together. We all have, have a common humanity. And I don't know of any other way to combat that self-stigma other than that human connection of people, being, you know, people telling their story and talking about their pain and talking about the way out and providing hope to that person at the other, on the other side of the table. And that seems to be the, it's maybe basic and elemental, but that seems to be how we change and how we change our perceptions of ourselves. I, I talked about the peer support program at home and, um, and you have um, organization here. Um, I had a young man, of course I work with the people in the state, and I had a young man's um, friend, it was a friend of the parents, who came to see me and said that this um, young man had a terrible a problem because his parents couldn't get him to go to treatment. He said he wasn't worth it and just all kinds of bad things. And um, I called this peer support program and they said, asked me how old is he? I said he's 17. And they said we have somebody 17 in our su peer support program who will go to see him. And I said well don't tell him you're from the peer support program. They said oh no we go as a friend and just kind of casually get to know him and then I can work with him. And, uh, and get him, and I think that's the only way, as you said, has to be somebody who knows the situation and can and let that young pe person know uh, that there is hope and he can recover. So um, the peer support program to me is just incredibly good. I'm just so excited about what's happened. You know. Well, thank you very much. Let's give one more round of applause for the great panelists.